the meeting today. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of background as to where we're at, what's going on. A lot of the things you, you obviously already know. You're here on the ground, you're living it. Then I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Girardi to speak a little bit about the, the legal aspects of what's been going on and what's going on and what could potentially go on in the future. And then uh, Aaron will talk to you a little bit about um, her involvement in the case and, and what you can expect on a go-forward basis. Um, you know, obviously you're aware that the, the, the sinkhole began in August of 2012. <coughs> At that time, some of the members of the community contacted Aaron Brockovich and said, Aaron, will, will you look at this? Will you come help us? This is our situation. This is our plight. Uh, Melissa, uh, many of you know Melissa that's in the back. Uh, Melissa came out, she was on the ground as quick as she could be and, and uh, met with some of y'all. And, and what it was about was um, Texas Brine and Oxy and their well and, and the sinkhole that they caused have caused you to find yourselves in an evacuation area. Um, I'll give the specifics of the science as the questions come forward. But, you know, the obvious speaks for itself. We've got a very, very bad situation here. Since that time, many of you have elected to become represented by the firm Girardi and Keys, and um, some of you are considering it. The reason for the meeting today is to update those of you that have already decided to sign on and to answer the questions. We understand that there's a lot of frustration in the community about what exactly is going on. We do not speak for Texas crime. I will tell you, that Aaron and I and Mr. Girardi have prosecuted these cases around the country and they all begin very, very similarly. Unfortunately, you find yourselves in a situation where you were evacuated in the middle of the night and um, are suffering uh, the immediate effects of what's going on here. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce Tom Girardi. Tom is the lawyer um, that is the head of the firm, obviously Girardi and Keys. And he'll speak to you a little bit about the, the legal situation um, at this time. Tom, I think you Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, we represent uh, a lot of people. And uh, I think some of you are going to have a little more significant anything to represent some of the lawyers for us to come and do one of the other things for the people. Keep it louder, sir. Thank you. Okay, I will. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Girardi, and uh, I, uh, I do this for a living. Uh, we've had these toxic cases all over the country. I was the trial lawyer in Aaron Rock about some time ago. And we have the Green Point case, cases in Kansas City, virtually cases all over the country, because this is very much a special in terms of trying to allocate faults, trying to allocate making sure people get what they're supposed to get out of this list. And when this thing first happened, I thought that these two companies, Oxy and Texas, would say to themselves, hey, listen, how do we make a right? It was our fault. And how do we make a right? And I thought there would be some chance of that. But there ain't no chance of that. Okay, I mean, they've made it very clear that the heck was their, their opinion. Absolutely, positively, without a doubt. You know, in life, you judge not so much of the distinction, because we all make mistakes, but you judge what you do after you make the mistake, try to make things right. And there is a way, I think, to try to make things right for you folks. This is devastating. I, I walked that problem at all. And uh, you guys have just been devastated. This is your home, your boss. This is your life savings. This is, these were your friends. Your kids were going to these schools. These were the relationships. And then all of a sudden you're out. No fault of your own. And absolutely positively knowledge that this thing was happening. They got rebuked years before uh, this thing uh, devastated all of you. And uh, so I think the only answer to this is you have to, you have to go forward with the litigation. You know, if you really point at that Exxon, you stop at maybe Exxon, you try to help people to the litigation. Then, uh, the Shell case, the Carson, you thought maybe after they had wiped out the whole community, you thought maybe Shell would want to do something kind of decent for the people that didn't have it. Corporate America, I'm, uh, I'm disgusted with the manner in which 
corporate America should have speak. And, you know, if this wasn't just the book. I know what I mean. This wasn't, you know, driving a little too quick and I didn't see the guy in front of me. You know, oh my goodness. These people knew what the hell was going on for a long time. No, absolutely, positively, without a doubt, before we got to the conclusion. So, you would think uh, they would have a little different attitude in terms of how can we somehow help these families that have been displaced? How can we somehow pay for the terrible stuff we've gone through? Some of these properties were rental properties that we relied upon. They were fast gone. Some of these properties were all the way down the line, and it's a county And I think that really the only answer is going to have to be the court system. The process is not quick, but I think that you don't really have much of an option um, because there's absolutely no willingness these companies cause this problem to make things right. So we've got to get an order to make it right. That's what has to happen. I think any jury listening to any of these stories, the devastation the families have gone through, as I just walked that car, I think I'm pretty nervous about it. So I hope you tell you, this is a terrible mess. So, in the toxic arena, there are lawyers that just do this and that for a living. Uh, I, I love my job because it's never a situation where Somebody just made a mistake. Never see a mistake. Can you speak up, please? Can you speak up? I'm not hearing anything you're saying. I'm sorry. I'm saying, can you speak up? Okay. I'll be my here. real good. So I think that there is a certain. Uh, it's it's important, I think, to kind of stick together and think about it. In other words, you have a much stronger voice if you're, if you're all together. They know you're facing this thing as a, as a whole mess. It's much more difficult for them to have to come to grips with you because they know exactly what the heck's going to happen if they don't if they don't resolve it. I was hopeful that you didn't need a lawyer, you know, or any lawyer, except just to say, yeah, this is the right thing to do. Uh, when this thing happened, you know, seven months now it's gone by. And they have no desire at all. You've got to go to the next level, it seems to me. And I think the only thing that you, you can do, and I think the lawyers in the room will agree with me, is there has to be a lawsuit file to go for it. That's all it is to do. Now, hiring lawyers is terrible. I know everybody hates to hire lawyers. We have a contingency agreement of 25%. Because I believe that this case will take a long time to go to this. Just in case, just in case there's a chance that we file this lawsuit for those of you that we represent. And they decide we want to immediately come to the table, we want to make everything right for these people, not just pay for the house, but for the devastation they've all gone through. The then I don't want to charge you that kind of that kind of thing. That is, you know, I think the reason that we're sought after across the country is because, you know, we always try and treat people very really good. And so if this thing could resolve somehow in the next six months, when they really sit down and do things, we would charge a very nominal fee, 10% of what we've received. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't hold that out as a carrot or anything like that. I just want you to know our good faith in trying to make sure that we do the best possible thing for you if in fact there is, if they change their end. So if it's a matter of all of a sudden putting together this picture of exactly what your loss is, et cetera, and then they come forward and want to pay that and pay for all the inconvenience and devastation and impact on the family and everything else, that's fine. You know, I don't. That'd be fine with you, it'd be great with you, you could all go on with your lives and so forth, it'd be very, very important. Don't, don't count on it. Generally, people that want to solve a problem don't wait till they get the one. You know what I mean? 
had plenty of time to do this. And it's very clear the attitude is such that uh, they don't give a damn about it. That's all they do. So we have to go on to the next, we have to go on to the next level. I should tell you this too, there are certain costs involved in these cases. And that's always an issue of the clients, because generally speaking, at the end of the day, the client has to pay those costs. But the more money a law firm is willing to put into a case, the better the result. That's all there is to it. We just, we just settled a drug case uh, for a lot of money, quarter of a million, quarter of a million dollars. And our settlements, and I don't mean to say this in a writer in fashion, that isn't my style, but we got five times more than all the other cases across the country. But we put $14 million of our own firm's money into these cases to develop them to make sure. So in this case, I need experts. In this case, I have to show exactly what the potential loss is. A lot of that work is done, but a lot of it is. So, Generally speaking, when you, if you represent a large group of people, one of the conditions that you propose on the other side is, okay, you've got to take the cost, you've got to cost of the thing, whatever. And that's one of the things that you just require to. So but there is a cost that generally speaking, um, if everything works successfully, the client becomes responsible. Obviously, the reason to stick together in these cases because no one family or even ten families can really afford to do this the right way in by terms of law. So it is kind of a unification thing that becomes very important. I don't want to, I'm not good at writing about myself. I don't like to do that. If you don't know me, this is a massive decision you have to make. And the people that, you know, with <coughs> deeply appreciative so forth. I'm a, uh, I'm a member of the Inner Circle of Advocates, which is limited to 100 lawyers in the country who've gotten all the larger awards. I'm a member and past president of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, which is limited to 500 lawyers in the world, and that uh, you know, represent people in the big litigation area. I've been involved in toxic cases even before everybody. Before that uh, case came up, uh, against the law community, cases really all across the country. Uh, right now, we have cases, I think, in 32 states. We have a large law firm because they throw big firms at you. And unless you have the ability to respond, you get mastered. We have 40 lawyers, 30 law clerks, uh, 40 secretaries. 20 data entry. In a situation like this, we got to get a lot of facts on each particular law. You know, to make sure that you're treated individually, to make sure that you, you get exactly what you're supposed to get when this thing all is set and done. So I think I've spoken too long. Uh, I didn't want to take that much time, but I, I'm very honored that I was asked to come. I'm very honored by those of you who paid us. I would be, uh, be very happy to do anything I possibly could do to make this right, because this is disgusting. And here, the, how many people have been treated by them is disgusting. It's disgusting. And hopefully, the, uh, hopefully the law will recognize that and make things right down the road. So that's about all I have to say. Anyway, Speaking, as a matter of fact, in case we have 14 million out of the firm, uh, we got a uh, client to put up 10 of it. So, you know, that's kind of, that's a negotiation standpoint. So, I think that'll, that'll be it. But at the end of the day, you know, to be honest, they say, okay, fine, we'll only pay you $300. You have to take the $20 of expense. Or we'll pay you $320. You know, so I don't want to say, that, you know, this is a save all of you. You know what I mean? But, um, and this is very, this is the same sort of agreements that we have all over the country with the courts. And I think that uh, it would be very difficult to find some people 
I don't know. Well, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. Well, uh, wherever we can rock, probably get it. Always under space. Well, if they up and leave, <coughs> your rights are still the same. If they stay here or leave or whatever, they get the damage. So they owe it. You know what I mean? So if they decide to get out and dodge, that doesn't mean anything as far as we're concerned. We still we still have the same right. <coughs> We had uh, a meeting the other day with uh, attorneys that were supposed to be part of a steering committee that a federal judge was supposed to be assigned to. I don't know if you saw the, the, the case on it, but could you look at this and sometimes later make these comments on it? Because they, you know, they're talking like, like they're the ones that's going to litigate this case. Well, it, it depends on things. I think we have a great chance to stay in state court. So if we stay in state court, the idea would be that the people will be represented individually in state court. Even if the matter gets transferred to federal court, you would still have your own voice, even if they're going to be needing counsel, or you know, or appoint somebody to need counsel. That doesn't mean that you're, you're no longer have your will. You still have the same right to say, yes, I've settled the case, or no, I don't. You still have the same right to have the experts involved in what you get in the water, but they're not. So I I lead, I lead counsel in Bayetta, Astros, <coughs> Orthonovum, Yaz, all, all over the place in these various cases, and in the Coxie cases, I generally appoint a lead as well. But, that doesn't mean that that's just for the stuff that if you're going to take a deposition of one of these guys from Oxygen, the court says, I'm not going to let you take 50 depositions. You birds have to get together and take one deposition of the guy from Oxygen. So that's the management skill of this particular case. You know what I mean? So if we do get into federal court, even with these, uh, even if the, the court is going to have a situation like this, it doesn't really affect us very much. You know what I mean? Other people still have a voice. Your lawyers still have a voice. And individually, you absolutely have a voice. Do you work with the, the, on the case? Oh, sure. You work with everyone. You know, even if we're over here in state court, and there's a federal court thing going on over here, we help them. We get some good evidence and so forth. And vice versa. You know, so that is a... I don't, I don't think that's really a serious issue. No, these are individual cases in which you have the right to individual representation. And the fact that there will be a steering committee or something, that doesn't have anything to do with, you know, settling the case or what anybody gets or anything. Sir, okay, so, so you're aware of that steering committee, aren't you? You know, uh, I heard that there was one, in, one up in the, uh, in, in the air, right? Right. And that's in the federal court cases. Not the same book. So, so you're aware of it, you're familiar with it, and you know that you have to submit about a 15 all the clients, names of all the clients that you're representing, right? If you're going to go into federal court, that's true. I think there's state court jurisdiction, and it would be our policy to file this in state court and go, go in that direction. Okay. They said that it would be faster in federal court. You know what, um, I think maybe it could be a little faster and it's never, it is never as good economically to compete, okay? I never lose it. Lawyers, the, the federal court, you're right, they want to push things around, okay, I'll be nice, settle, you know, but the state court may take a little longer, but it's my experience with 40 years of practice, all over the country, the state court is a better venue for the people, for the individuals. Yes, sir. Well, no, I can't do that somewhere right there. All right, let me so, have to be put up there. We met with the place, said that this was already 
heard the federal court, and it was Texas Brian's right to be heard in the federal court. Um, that may be true. There's, there's going to be a dispute on this because we have Occidental. We have so there are some issues with respect to that. And if the case does get transferred to the federal court, those are the cards we have. Those are the cards we have. Like. You know what I mean? So it's not it's not the end of the world here, one way or another. In this particular case, your rights are so good, your conduct is so bad, it is so disgusting that I think that there's a very good opportunity we will succeed pretty well. And if there is anybody in Texas Brian who's a resident here who had anything to do with this, that person would be me too. So if I'm me, if, if I'm a resident right here in this state, and I had much to do with this cover-up and everything else, then I can be sued right here. So there has to be total diversity, namely not just Texas and Brian, but everybody who's in the lawsuit. So we're looking at that particular lawsuit. But if it is, if it does end up in federal court, it does, I think your rights are still very strong. They did some terrible stuff, and they damaged this whole thing. Okay, you have one more. <laughs> Could you explain to the residents how long, in order to be included in a litigation lawsuit, what is the time frame for which they have to enter that, enter that, you know, sign with an attorney? You know, I think what well, kind of time frame are we talking about? It's our position, we've already done a draft of the complaint, and we would like to probably in three weeks get the complaint on the file. You know, I mean that's where that's where we would like to go. But is there out is there an outside line in there that I you gotta that. get it before that? No, I, I don't think that there's any statute of limitations for uh, A lot of times you worry about that in the case. These are property damage cases primarily. You know, not necessarily injury cases, but there's a different statute. So I don't believe there's a, I don't think there's an issue on that. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're under any pressure to, you know, sign immediately to things of that nature. On the other hand, I think that if you're going to do this right, you should probably band together so it's well known out there who exactly is in this case. And, you know, that would be my gut reaction to it. So you're saying that in three weeks is better that that's when you're going to file your case with the state? Yes, it'd be our, our goal is to get this thing on file in three weeks. You know, I think because Bob and so forth was here before, and I really thought that there would be a real effort by these people to try and make everything right. You know, because you only have a certain amount of time to sign with somebody, don't you? You do, but I think we're certainly in the period. I okay. You know, I, I don't want to give quite the legal opinion on this yet without more facts. But okay. I feel very confident we don't have any problems to go forward in three weeks and then to get get the thing done. Thank you. We're going to take a whole bunch of questions here in a minute. I want to give Aaron a chance to talk about the three of us on this panel. panel you guys did, yeah. I, I think that there is a lot of concern, and I know we're going to hear a lot more questions about that when we come back up to the question and answer part, about this jurisdictional issue. Um, I got confused in reading what, you're, what you've got there in front of you. Um, the judge in the federal court actually threw one of them back in the state court. So if you want to talk about a jurisdictional mess, it sounds like whoever's done that, I don't know who it is, has kind of already screwed it up. And so wherever we end up, you know, you've heard Mr. Girardi, we want to go to state court, we want to protect you as individuals. I've fought 50 cases with this guy, and that's the only way he goes. Now, this, this whole thing about, you know, you heard him give you a little bit of, of strategy there, and I hope you heard it. If a manager for Texas Brian lives in the state, blows diversity, we stay in state court, guys. That's the nice way of putting that. How many of you probably know somebody that works in Texas, Brian or Oxy, that lives in the state of Louisiana? Thank you. Done. We're out. We're not, we're not going there. Okay. The other thing you heard Mr. Gerardi talk about was the way you win these things and the way you win these quick is you band together, you stick together, and you get behind somebody who can lead you as a community. A lot of your community members, you know, Vicky right here, a lot of these people, they were the ones that kind of got together and called Aaron in the first place. What's really good uh, that Aaron does is when Aaron comes in and unites a community, 
and you do stick together, and sometimes it's one year, two years, three years, four, she keeps you together, and that's the most important thing you can do, because that's the way you win and you win fast. When Texas Brian read the newspaper last Monday or Tuesday that Tom and Eric were coming to town, there was a little pucker factor going on over there, and it was bigger than the same pole. Okay? <laughs> So with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have Aaron come up and talk about how you guys all stick together, and then we'll take questions until the cows come home. How many pins we got over there? As long as it takes you guys to do it. So, Aaron. Hi, everybody. Hi,
you would with Tom and Bob as well. But my biggest message is something, because of the work that I've done for so long, and because I just had another recent big event of my life, I've now become a first-time grandmother. And when this little baby was born,
would be called upon. Uh, we can't hear you back here at all. Okay. And these rude people that can't be quiet, you know. Okay. I said that you're going to be required to give an awful lot of information so that we truly understand your laws, be it mineral rights, be it the rent of property that you no longer rent from, be it your own home that you put the money down for two months before the whole thing ran. Whatever that may be, these are all individual things. This would not be a part of a, a functional system. This would be one-on-one -on -one with lawyers in our firm that if we're selected, that you would then look to us and we can get all this information individually to make sure we're on the same page with you. And I also think it's very important that we have lawyers, if you have a lawyer, I don't want you to change the lawyer. You know what I mean? This isn't, this isn't one of those things that come with me if you're being represented. The only reason we're here is because we represented a bunch of you and we were asked by others saying you may want to get but no other type of story with us. So that's the reason we're here. And that's very important. I don't want to interfere with a relationship that you've already had with another law firm. I'm sure you stay right there. And, and then too, if you want to go seek somebody else, talk to somebody else, then do that. You know what I mean? That's, that's important too. But obviously, if you feel like the only people that we are always represent, we'd be happy to do that. So that's the idea. Okay, so you guys are hungry and you want to live again. Yes, ma'am. So it is a prerogative of change lawyers if you want to. I just want to say it's an option. Well, you do have that prerogative, but I don't want to do that. I know that's not what you're having. Okay, that's my, that's my attitude. Good lawyers are good lawyers. Right. And they have a relationship I want to do to stay with them, you know, unless there's a real good reason. Or sometimes a lawyer that may represent just one or two folks, realizing the massive work that they do to this thing, would say, hey, listen, why don't I join with you? You know, so some lawyers say that to them. But that's another, that's another issue. You know, where I don't want people changing and so forth. I mean, lawyers are lawyers, I love lawyers. I like those people. Yes, sir. Uh, well, no firm uh, getting behind the data of um, the situation we have here in the morning. Yes. Large stuff, you know, yes. Oh, we have the data. Yes. We do for right. sure. Especially Bob has done an awful lot of work on this stuff. And you have kind of read the zone that you've already collected? Every, every, probably everything that they've given you, but. Very, or virtually everything that's coming out of the state and, and uh, federal government, all their, their analysis and tests, we keep on top of them and try to get the, the new reports probably before they're summarized into collective reports, just the raw data. So we've got a lot of raw data that we've tabulated as well. The problem is getting worse. You guys know that. I've seen a couple of lists of chemicals, and it's a pretty long laundry list of different chemicals. Yeah, are they average weight chemicals, or are they just uh, regular natural gas? Oh no, there's other chemicals, other than natural, natural gas, yes. Hazardous? Yes. And then get some more things. Yes. Yes. Okay, he, he's concerned about the, the other chemicals in the caverns that are bubbling up. Somebody asked me that on the drive down here. Um, I don't know that it's, it's had a water quality impact yet in order for the chemicals to become soluble. Most of them are um, volatile organics, and so what happens is, is they'll stick with the methane that's coming up, and they'll off-gas right out with it. So, you know, you're going to want to, what would make the water bad, or the water table, the water table is a different situation. But the actual water in the bayous and the surface waters, the water will, will take care of that and off-gas it relatively quickly. So I'm, I'm not concerned about the fish species or some of the animals unless they actually physically get trapped in it'll be gas. I mean, if they get up under a bog and they're like living in a bog and the gas gets trapped in there, they'll die. Okay, but whether bodies will actually uptake these chemicals, the laundry list I've got, one of them here is, is you know, there's like 60 chemicals on it. So there's a lot of chemicals in that stuff. I mean, methane, methane's just a carrying agent. <coughs> All these chemicals that dissolve in the water, you're not breathing in the air? Yes. So the breathing problem, no, not all of them, but the breathing problem 
um, is a much bigger problem than the water problem right now. Eventually, well, you guys all saw the same boat, right? What did it do? Fill up with water. I'm more concerned about that aspect and the dissolved minerals associated with the water going into the sinkhole than I am with the gas coming up right now. So your properties are impacted by the gas. The bayou is experiencing a problem with the fact that it's now physically in contact with that cabin. So you've got both things going on at the same time. I quite do follow on air quality. As in the air quality of the BB oil spill. Yes. It was a nightmare. And you're seeing some of the, the clean air uh, act violations without a doubt that are taking place. I don't know if they have to mention that that's, I think that's secondary at this point, to the point you're concerned. The Clean Air Act violations, are they secondary? No, absolutely not. Um, I don't think there's any regulation of those right now at all. I, I think the air regulatory authorities um, are probably afraid to come look. I mean, it's a, it's a, you, you're in a bad situation here. I physically smelled it. Uh, I can add, uh, as far as mental health, it's uh, so too late to the public health. Uh -huh. uh, we are, I uh, have a uh, understudy for four people, uh, for people in, in the area. There is a mental health study that's been funded and is being taken place in Tulane. Mental health? Yes, sir. Oh, I, let's exchange cards after this. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there any disadvantage of us that we don't have our home? If we were to put those of us that have not home with an attorney, and we're still in our home, would that be a problem for you? No, that isn't a problem. How, how would we get the information? But I think maybe it would be a problem for you as time goes on. Now, this is happening. You know what I mean? And I know you don't want to leave and all that stuff. But you're going to need some good advice that you know this stuff is explosive and everything else out there. So these are these are problems. You know, when the damages are the same because the place is useful. You could never sell it. It's condemned, etc. And but you do run a certain risk, and I don't want to tell you what that risk is. But there's a reason they tell people to get the heck out. You know, I mean, believe me, they're not doing any favors. Uh, at all, I mean, the reason it told you to get out is there, it's a real hassle. It's, it's there. So, is there some uh, material you can give us? There's several others that have not. I'm sorry. Who is the one of you? Who is the one of you? Okay. Come see me. Real, this gentleman. The Miller Gavin is there supposedly saying that it's been in the breach. Right next to the Gavin is there now. Yes. Are y'all aware of that? Yes. And it's, there's, there's one that's eminent, which, back to your question, I, I'm afraid for all of you, if you're staying, okay? I was with a, a methane expert in a completely unrelated case in a hearing room on Thursday afternoon, and it was dueling PhDs. And our PhD said, at 1 to 5%, methane's going to explode at zero pressure. And their expert said, methane's going to explode, but it has to be under pressure. You're all under pressure. Okay? And when I have the leading expert from Shell Oil and my expert saying, it doesn't take pressure to explode, and him saying it takes pressure to explode, and then I come visit you all, and you're under pressure, that's two people saying, get out. So, yes, I don't have an answer. Her question is, why haven't they done a forced evacuation? They're presently, correct me if I'm wrong, they're presently calling it mandatory. Mandatory, under federal government terms, is pretty strong words. And I don't want to, I can only equate this with the best words I know how to use, is, it's Louisiana. <laughs> get away with that here. In California, they probably would have come with guns. <laughs> uh, we're getting some basic information here. And some of the meetings that we've had, we had one geologist said, somebody asked, would you let your grandkids live out here? 
he said, no, I was. Another geologist was asked the same kinds of questions. I mean, if we're sure that out here, he said, I would have any problem. We're getting, yeah, well, he, we're getting fixed there. He used to work for Chevron. Just a quick question. The people that don't and they stay, when it's going to come to the uh, to the dam, not the house, but their personal metal and whatever else, are they, is that factor going to be taken in as to what they want to get? Offer for different from the people that have to You know, I don't, I don't think so because the house is useless. You know, and you're going to have to get out of the school, right? I know that. You know, if you want to drag it out a little bit, that's the decision to make. But sooner or later, you're not to leave. I mean, I know it's a big thing because if you've got to go to mandatory evacuation, that's a big order. No, but not for a home. I'm talking about the door of. You know, you told me how many down the street and into the beach. 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 Now, also, I have been doing this before. So on an average, how long, what, when do they still have to pay? How long are they going to be paying? What happens when Texas Crown comes out of the future? Is there another company that they can go after so the people can continue to get them? Once they come up and move their allowances, they can put it out there. Well, that's going to be the company that they can not the So, on the other hand, they would have to understand that all of this is fine. That's not what it doesn't mean in the channel of food pieces in the school. That's what they're making these problems. I don't think that's going to go on the table. But, once again, I'm not going to answer that question as what, to what they do, because that's their decision. Okay, okay. Okay, so you're saying that they have to make putting a canister in there to tell. How do I know these monitors aren't reading right or they're reading right? I don't know. It's just right there to say. So when when would you make it available if we were a client of yours to have these canisters in our home to find out if we're unsafe or safe with gases in our house? What makes it Tom and I were talking about that on our way out here when we were in the neighborhood. What makes this situation a little bit more difficult until we get a critical mass of, of clients? and we actually get the case on file, I have no standing. I'm Joe Smo off the street when I walk onto the, the emergency response center. When we represent you and I have some authority in cloud, then I can contact them and say, we represent this block of plaintiffs and this is the testing we'd like to coordinate with you. What are you doing? We don't want to spend, everybody's concerned about cost, we don't want to spend your money twice. We're going to split sample some things when it's appropriate. We think there's some cheating going on. Right. But there are all kinds of additional tests 
that do need to be done. And we'll advise the government what needs to be done, and we'll consult with them, and, and the relationship usually works pretty well. Because my, my husband was in our garage, just for example, and he started his generator, and the alarms went off. Sure. They hauled tail like you would not believe. But we're just talking a little generator in the outside shed. So my concern is like if something were to start anywhere, I guess, because they didn't tell us we had to move those things. The first they said, yes, we have to move them, no hairspray, no this, no that, no whatever. But now it's okay to have all that. So is that just because it's so little? I don't thing? know what you have. I need to come look at what you have. You probably have just some online methane monitoring equipment. That's what they are. Yeah, that's, that's all they that's, are. That's, you know, it, it, that, you can buy those at Home Depot. I mean, they're really giving you the minimal amount of protection. One of the things that I want to caution you all about is what's going on out there right now is just, it's literally a band-aid to kind of get their arms around what's going on. They're still kind of freaking out trying to figure out what's going on. And it's going to take them a while to do it. Otherwise, they would have released the mandatory evacuation order. The biggest concern that I have is the standards for this type of soil gas migration that's going on, especially in very wet areas like bayous, is, is developing every week. We're getting new information, new standards on how to regulate it, how to monitor it. What you need to know is when the weather changes, the barometric pressure comes in with clouds, it holds that gas down with more pressure than it's coming out. If you get a good weather day and the clouds go, whew, barometric pressure lifts, that stuff's coming up. Right. And somebody fires off a, a, a piece of equipment somewhere, boom, neighborhood's gone. And so there's just all these dynamics that they're not even talking to you about. Weather pattern shifts are not your friend in this neighborhood right well, now. Well, that's how I felt. I felt like they were just trying to comfort me by putting these monitors in my house. That's why you smell it more at night. It has nothing to do with the sun going down. It has to do with the barometric pressure. Air man. One uh, uh, answer question I was thinking about is uh, uh, the pressure on the uh, campus. The pressure has nothing to do with it. Why is it explosive? It's explosive disks of the chemicals that are by and it's by cover. There's more explosive right. right. chemical in it from all public. Yep. That's it. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. Spot. Try to respond to improve your, uh, your trust and uh, nice to spend your time and thank you very much.